Thank you. Welcome to this session. And for your interest in this session, a uh, very important session, we are looking at the sources of long-term capital in Africa. Uh, development is about people, it's about communities, it's about societies. To build uh, healthy and developed societies, we need long-term assets such as uh, roads to be able to take um, farm produce to the market. We need railways uh, to be able to transport our goods in a more efficient way. Thank you. We need airports to be able to move from one place to, to the other. And also more fundamentally, we need human development uh, investment such as in health and in education. All these are long-term uh, expenditures. Uh, consequently, for us to um, finance these long-term expenditures, we need long-term capital. And this is something that we lack in Africa, long-term capital, uh, capital that goes to 20, 30, 50 years, you know, because uh, returns, and for instance, on a railway line, and I was just uh, uh, discussing with one of the participants about the SGR railway in Kenya that connects um, um, Mombasa to Nairobi, then it's supposed to connect Nairobi to Kampala, then from Kampala to DRC. We need long-term investment to do that, not 10-year um, loans or uh, short-term um, capital. Uh, the same with um, industries. Industries take time to set up, uh, you know, to break even, to give back. So we also need long-term capital for that. And um, how do we raise this long-term capital? This afternoon, we have uh, several experts that are going to take us through that discussion of how we raise um, long-term capital for Africa. Good afternoon. Yes, now I'm going to make a presentation. The presentation is based on uh, a working paper developed on a savings book uh, which was supported by UNUID. So this is work which has been work, uh, going on in terms of how do we mobilize savings in developing countries. So from that, we came up with a uh, working paper. And one of the things that is of concern is on pension funds. If you're talking about developing countries, then issues of pension becomes a prominent aspect, unlike the developed countries. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is the characteristics of the countries. They tend to be poorly developed. The income levels are very low. So that means automatically savings would be low. So it essentially means then that if poverty levels are high, then you expect the elderly to suffer even more because they don't have any immediate source of income. So that's why this is key. Other than that, these countries have a financing need to support development, especially on infrastructure and the rest. So in most cases, they rely on loans. Basically, debt, it can be external debt or some financial support. But one way through which they can address this is through deveraging on the pension funds, especially the pension funds uh, market is well developed because this can be a source for long-term financing. So that is the basis for this uh, study. So in terms of the outline, I'll just go to the introduction and then a brief on the pension funds and the role in resource mobilization. After that, I'll look at the performance of pension funds within the sub-Saharan African context, looking at uh, investments, uh, uh, returns, and the rest. And then the demographic characteristics of sub-Saharan African countries, which is also key in terms of understanding how all the challenges facing pension funds. And then a few case studies. We do case studies in three countries, Chile, uh, South Africa, which is a uh, sub-Saharan African country, and Netherlands. And we derive some uh, lessons from the case studies, and then a brief on challenges we pick up from the overall overview, and then what we can do to boost pension savings in sub-Saharan Africa. One aspect that is key is that the elderly people need support. And this mainly comes from the social pension problems. And this ensures them some level of basic income, because at that point they're not employed. So they need some 
kind of fallback position or in terms of how they can support themselves. Pensions also, social pensions also offer avenue for income redistribution among generations from the elder generation and the long generation and also provide some form of insurance. The most form common form of uh, pensions for the elderly is the social protection. So we have a number of programs for social protections and pensions becomes one of them. And the statistics we get from the ILO World Social Protection Report is that about 78% of people above retirement age receive some form of old age pension. And this is what they rely on as an alternative source of income and not coming from the contribut contributory aspect. Because if it's contributory, then that means they have to support their future pension. The only challenge we have is that the statistics are very uh, not very good for Africa, sub-Saharan African countries. For instance, uh, on average globally, we have about 33% of working age population contribute to a pension. But for sub-Saharan African countries, just six about 6%. In terms of labor force contribution, globally the average is about 52%, but for Sub-Saharan Africa it's about 9%. So this shows the gap in terms of the development or contribution to social uh, schemes in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa country. Now the major characteristics we see in the pension schemes in Sub-Saharan Africa country is that one, the coverage is very low. We are going to look at this statistics going forward. The cost of running these pensions also tend to be high, both administrative costs and the cost of setting them up and the and then the nature of the pension scheme is that they are regressive because they only target the formerly employed, mean, meaning that they leave out the informal sector. And the informal sector forms a key part of the population of the labor force in the developing countries. So given this, uh, the statistics we have is that less than 10% of older population in sub-Saharan African countries have contributory schemes, meaning that over 90% or about 90% do not contribute to any pension. And this is where the problem comes in, because if you're not contributing to a pension, then there's need for support, especially going forward. And the reason for this is that most of the labor force in the, in the formal sector. And now statistics uh, generally available shows that about 85% of sub-Saharan African countries are employed in the informal sector. So that means if you're in the informal sector and you're not also contributing to pension, then there's likely to be a problem as uh, you come up to past the retirement age, around 65 years of age. Now, the problem with this is that the informal workers, especially the elderly one, face a lot of shocks. And one of the studies uh, done by Alfas 2021 showed that the informal workers, the older informal workers, uh, who did not have any social protections were affected more during the pandemic by COVID-19. So this shows the vulnerability of this group of population. Another thing for the Southern African countries is the demographic structures. They have youthful population. The population growth rate also tends to be high. Dependence ratios are low. If you look at it, then you may say that if dependence ratio is low, then that may be a good thing. But it's because of the demographic structure. More youth than the elderly people. So it means that over time, the aging population will be increasing. And this will need more support going forward, given the high infertility, high infertility rates and the bigger size of the informal sector. Another aspect is the multi-generational nature of the households, the interdependence so that older generations depend on uh, younger generation. But the problem is that given the change in the demographic structures, the household sizes are becoming much smaller. And uh, households are also becoming less interdependent so that there's no support for uh, older generations. So that means then as people age, then over time they lose this source of social support, which brings in a key issue. But then, why do we need pension funds? So why do we have to look at the pension funds issue? There are four aspects. One is because of the livelihood, uh, it's the main source of livelihood, especially for the elderly. So it provides them income security, and this covers issues of consumption smoothing. That means they can be able to get uh, income to support their consumption expenditure. It's also form us as a form of risk sharing mm. among the elderly. Issues of poverty also comes in redistribution of income. The second is the issue of addressing social inequality. Because without pensions, inequality will be high, especially between the old and the young. And we can address this using the uh, pension and reduction of poverty and gap pressure among the elderly. The third is the protection, uh, the issue of socioeconomic risk, which we protect using the pensions. And lastly, is the role of pension in providing uh, resources, especially for long-term investments, given their long-term nature. Briefly, let's look at the extent of social protection in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we've already said that uh, less than 20% of the population above social pension age 
receive a pension anytime within uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But if you go to specific countries, in Kenya we have a ratio of about 70% who get regular income from pension. That is based on the Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey. And from the Fin Access Survey 2021, only about 11% of adult population use pension schemes. So these are people who uh, save in a pension uh, scheme. For Zambia, the ratio is about 8.2% uptake, and for Uganda, it's about 18% of the working population. So this shows the gap that is still there. And if this can be, uh, this, if, uh, this can be addressed, then other than addressing the socioeconomic needs, then there's also a way of mobilizing resources for uh, development. Now, the characteristics of the sub-Saharan Africa countries also comes in. One, the savings rates are low. So the question is, how do we improve the savings rate? Secondly, we have low, uh, low financial literacy levels, which is also a concern, and has been identified by many studies. Financial inclusions also tend to be low, though recently this has been addressed by the issue of technology, using the mobile banking and the rest. And then the huge informal sector, low incomes and high dependence rates. So these are uh, factors which affect the level of uh, pension development in sub-Saharan African country. Now the graph there shows, the figure basically shows a basic cross-sectional analysis between a benefit level of social pension and economic development. And we find a positive association. It's not about concession, but association, so that a more developed pension system may spur economic development mm -hmm. through provision of financing for infrastructure development. But we also expect that if a country is well developed, then the social pension system will also be likely to be developed. So this is just to infer the relationship between the two. So let's look at the pension funds and resource mobilization. One of the things that uh, sub-Saharan countries face is uh, high levels of socioeconomic challenges. So these challenges means that they need to be financed from some. But the problem is that there's are an issue with mobilization of resources and capacity constraints in, on lending to infrastructure projects. So though there are avenues through which uh, funds can be raised, but raising these funds also becomes a challenge. Now it's estimated that the annual infrastructure gap is between $68 billion and 180 billion dollars that is as of 2018, but this is expected to expand even going further. So this then calls for the need to find alternative avenues to raise funds to meet these financing needs. And one of the ways that this can be addressed is the long-term investment coming from pension funds and other, uh, other uh, institutions which you can also help this, for instance, insurance and the rest, if they can mobilize enough resources, then this can help be the gap. And this is because these institutional, institutional investors have long-term uh, investment horizons. So essentially then, if pension resources can be taken to finance investment in infrastructure, then this can open avenues for diversification of this, uh, for the institutional investors like pension funds and help them cover against inflation risks, which also tends to be higher in developing countries and the interest rate issues. But other than that, Pension also plays an important role in development of capital markets because they support liquidity in these markets. And hence, if that happens, then we'll have expansion level of uh, capital markets as well. Now, the figure we are showing just shows the relationship between pension funds and infrastructure, and how pension funds uh, leads to development in some of the, these countries. So we have three channels through which uh, pension funds can uh, support growth. One is through the financial channel, which happens through the capital markets. So if pension funds develop, then that improves liquidity in the capital markets. As the liquidity improves, then there'll be funds to finance infrastructure projects. And then there's also a feedback mechanism from infrastructure to capital market development. The second is through the uh, labor market. Pension funds uh, brings avenues for formalization of uh, labor markets and improve efficiency in the labor market. If that happens, then that can support growth and the pension funds at the same time. And then through fiscal sustainability or the fiscal channel is where countries will now have alternative resources to finance development activities. So instead of relying on debt, then they can finance using the long-term funds coming from the pension funds. So this will lead to fiscal sustainability and improved growth. So this is what I uh, summarize in this uh, slide. So basically the financial channel, uh, fiscal channel, and the labor market channel. So that means we have a direct linkage from the development field of pension funds and performance of these economies. So if this can be enhanced, then we know that we can be able to get funds and develop this country. So that's the interlinkages. So let's briefly look at the performance of the funds. And we look at the three issues. One is the asset base. We look at the extent to which this uh, 
uh, funds have assets and the allocation of these assets. Secondly, we look at the investment. And here we mainly focus on the areas where they invest all the products that they have uh, and, the, uh, and the returns and then the membership and contribution. So basically what we find is that uh, most of the assets uh, that these uh, funds invest in are the, the, the assets they invest in are mainly in the financial and uh, mainly in government securities. And uh, what this means then is that they are limited in terms of what they can get out of that because they are running away from the risk. So that means the return generated from uh, investment in these assets is not enough to support uh, the pension benefits upon retirement. And uh, in terms of distribution, these are uh, different in terms of asset allocation. If you look at South, Southern African countries, they are mainly in equities. The West African, East African mainly on government bonds or fixed income assets. So this shows the extent to which these countries also invest and the asset classes in which they go into. So the table just shows the retirement savings plans in terms of uh, the value in terms of US dollar millions and high investment is in South Africa and Namibia. We are basically the Southern African region and maybe Nigeria. But if you look at uh, the returns on investment, which is uh, the next uh, the next slide, total savings in terms of a percentage of GDP South Africa has a ratio of about above 80%, followed by Namibia. The others, the proportion is very low, showing that there's still room for expansion of these uh, pension uh, funds. Now, investments, uh, most of the funds, as I said, invest in sh short term assets. So, this creates a mismatch between investments made and the nature of these funds because pensions are basically long term savings. And secondly, it also affects the returns. So, if it affects the returns, then the benefit that accrues to pensioners at the end will also be affected. So if the nominal, nominal returns are low, then the real returns also expected to be much lower, given the high inflation rates uh, that sub saharan countries have. So in terms of the returns, Malawi has the highest nominal return, averaging about 26 there, 2026 20, there, but it has been going down, uh, followed by Zambia and then Nigeria. Others have uh, a bit lower return rates. And in terms of uh, where they invest, this is defined by regulation in this country. So this is just a table showing what happens in Kenya over time. And you'll find that most of the investment goes to government securities. So the last column shows the allowable limit uh, by regulations, but you'll find the, it's concentrated government securities and quoted equities, essentially, and immovable property. So that means there's no diversification of uh, investment of pension funds, and this affects the returns that they get. Membership also looks at the extent to which people are covered by pensions, uh, especially the working age population. And we find that uh, the performance is better in countries where membership contributes to a high proportion of the working age. And this happens in countries where you have universal uh, pension systems. Mainly, most of them are in uh, sub Southern African countries. For instance, if you look at that table, then we have Namibia, South Africa performing a bit much better. Now, I don't know whether I've gone back. Okay. So, a number of countries have come up with policies to address this. And they're coming up with innovative ways to do this. One of them is the Kenya, where we have a mobile pension plan. It's a mobile-based contributory scheme targeting informal workers. Then you have the Rwanda case, where we have a Joheza, a government-sponsored voluntary scheme, uh, defined contribution scheme open to all citizens. So the idea is that this tries to be all-inclusive, including the informal sector and the, those who are not working within the framework. Demographic statistics will go a bit faster, given the uh, time challenge. First, we have a young population, which is growing, because uh, we have the fertility rates also higher. So the issue with this is that dependence are increasing at a faster rate, and the number of older population meetings uh, that need social support is also increasing. If you look at the annual rate of population changes, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is about 2.6, percent which is, tends to be among the highest compared to other regions. So if the fertility rate is high and population and the projected growth of uh, older persons about 3.0%, that means the p p growth in the elderly population is much higher than the uh, population growth rate. So essentially over time we'll have higher uh, number of elderly people who need support. So with the low levels of uh, pension coverage and population growth rate, what we see is that this creates a concern for these countries. 
And what we have in the statistics is that only about 20% of uh, people of pensionable age receive old age pension in South Southern Africa. Global level is about 78%. So this shows the gap that is there. The youthful em uh, empl unemployment rate also tends to be higher. So though population is growing, but the unemployment rate is also higher. So th this limits the ability to save for retirement and also the bigger size of the informal sector. So these are the challenges which affect growth of the informal sector. So though the dependent, old age dependency ratio is, tends to be much lower, about 5% in sub-Saharan Africa, but this is expected to grow going forward. So that's the concern that is there. For instance, compared to Europe, where we have about 22% uh, 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 dependency ratio. In terms of population above uh, statutory pension age, sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest rate of about 20%. Uh, but then we have high variance across the regions, mainly higher, say, in uh, southern African countries. Okay. Now, let me go to the case studies. So we are looking at Chile, South Africa, and Netherlands. Chile was among the first countries to introduce social insurance schemes, so that's why it's a key important case. South Africa is among the oldest uh, and advanced pension systems in southern Africa, and they have done a number of reforms. And Netherlands is among the countries with the best performing pension institutions in the world. And what we pick from this are about uh, five lessons. One is that there's a need for a mix of compulsory and contributory social pension to cut off for the low earners and contributory schemes. This will be able to take care of all the population. Second is that the contributory pension schemes need to be bundled with other products because this gives an added value. For instance, group insurance cover to improve the uptake of pension schemes. And then third is that pension funds should be indexed to prices to protect against higher rates of inflation and hence the return that people get at the end of the day. The another one is that withdrawal of pension benefits should be based on annuity rather than uh, uh, lump sum withdrawals because this preserves the fund and enables that, uh, the elderly people to sustain usage of the funds over time. And then we also need incentives on pension fund contributions through favorable tax consideration. So given this, what are the challenges of pension funds? One is the low pension participation rate, which we've seen comes from the high levels of unemployment, informality, and the rest. Second is the low contribution rates. Low contribution rates arises from low earnings, because if you're earning less, you can't contribute more. And then uh, this limits savings and uh, pension receipts upon retirement. Then there's low coverage, which basically arises from lower participation and low returns. And then the restrictive regulatory environment. Some of the countries have not reformed their pension system. So this limits the, the extent to which uh, pension uptake can take place. And then financing of pension becomes, also becomes an issue because most social pension are financed through taxes. And since they're facing uh, fiscal challenges, then this cannot be sustained for long. So what can be done? Uh, we have about uh, four things that can be done. One is increasing pension participation and coverage by including the, those in the informal sector and the unemployed within the pension system. So that means we need a mix of universal uh, pension, non-contributory scheme, and the contributory scheme. Second, we need to enhance pension benefits uh, to help us uh, build this by bundling pension with other products and then leverage on advances in te digital technology, especially mobile uh, technology, which has been prevalent in developing countries. And then the last is reforming the legal and regulatory framework. Uh, thank you.